Welcome to the Walsh Literacy Initiative's Rita Palooza. In this session, we feature Dr. David Kilpatrick. Um, I'm taking a look at the time here. They gave me about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, this is going to go till about 4 o'clock, actually. I uh, hope you don't mind. No, I'll, I'll keep it within that time period. But I do warn you, it's going to be fast-paced. So what I want to talk about is um, not really nuts and bolts in terms of uh, uh, teaching per se, but more nuts and bolts in terms of what we need to have kids with reading problems do in terms of what, what's going on with word level reading. How do we remember words? Like when you look at a page and you're reading, you're not sounding out the words as you go along. You're only going to sound out a word that you're unfamiliar with. So we build up a, a large what sometimes is referred to as a site vocabulary. Researchers call it an orthographic lexicon. We build up this large uh, cache of, of words that allow us to move smoothly through text. How does that happen? And why, why are some children struggling with it? To help us understand this, uh, and reference was made to the Haskins Laboratory earlier, and they really were the ones that opened this all up back in the 1960s, early 70s connecting the linguistic nature of the alphabetic writing system. With alphabetic writing systems, this may sound strange, but we don't write words. They write words in Chinese. Uh, you know, each character is going to represent a particular concept or idea. But in alphabetic-based writing, whether it's English, Spanish, or any other alphabet, we don't write words. What we do is we write phoneme-based characters. And we string those phoneme-based characters together in order to uh, refer to what we would call a written word. Um, so alphabets, by their very nature, are designed to capture spoken pronunciations at the phoneme level. And so that means if you have poor access to the phonemes of spoken language, as is the case with those with dyslexia and similar word level reading difficulties, and I, and I say dyslexia, that's just a matter of where, where, you, where you put the cutoff, right? So poor word level reading is how researchers define dyslexia. Now, most people will acknowledge that phonemic skills are important for sounding out words, but what's less known is what research has shown about how important phonology is at the phoneme level for remembering words. Now, there's two levels of word reading, and children with reading difficulties, word reading difficulties, they often have problems with both of these. The first is the ability to identify an unfamiliar word, and the second is the ability to remember a word, so we're not sounding it out over and over again. Uh, phonic instruction helps with the first, but uh, it will not necessarily help with the second. I'll come back to, to the interaction between these two uh, a little bit later when we talk about, uh, briefly anyway, about phonics instruction. And as I'm going to show you, the first uh, skill is necessary for the second. So we're not remembering words based on some sort of visual memory process. Uh, we are remembering words based on the phonemic structure and the orthographic structure. What do you mean by orthographic? Orthographic just sim simply means the correct letter order uh, within a given word, the proper way to spell something. Uh, this graph could be multiplied across lots of different studies, and th th this is a little bit older. That, that doesn't matter for our point. What you see here on the left-hand side, the vertical is exception words. So you're only going to be able to read those if you know those words. You sound them out, you're going to get them wrong. So it's sort of an index of how many words you already know. And then across the bottom are your ability to sound out unfamiliar words. So we're kind of looking at this memory process, but we're also looking at the uh, sounding out process. And, and, and of course, we have individuals, children that are poor at both, and you have individuals who are strong at both. But you also have kids who actually are pretty good at sounding out words, but they're not good at remembering words. And th these are often kids who have had some formal phonic training, and they have shown improvements in this domain. But not all kids that receive phonics instruction, as we'll see, we'll see that the phonic knowledge and in instruction is essential. Um, it's not a, it's not negotiable. You, you know, all skilled readers, as you see here, all skilled readers have phonic knowledge. Uh, show me a, a skilled reader from third grade on who can't sound out simple nonsense words, right? You have, even if they're not taught it, those kids that go and learn in spite of the instruction have to learn the system, have to learn the code, right? So phonics is a non-negotiable in, in terms of that knowledge base uh, and skill. But what we don't see are kids who are really good at remembering words from third grade on, you know, that you can fake it through kindergarten first with some visual memorization, but then there are too many words that look alike. So the uh, phonic skills are also necessary, a foundation for remembering words. 
Now here's a question that science needs to answer. I'm gonna put this up here and you can kind of read <laughs> while, while you're listening. But most uh, educated adults have between about 30 and 70,000 word data bank of familiar words. And if you reflect upon this, chances are you don't really remember uh, the process of storing those words. We came across the words, we sounded them out, we moved on, we didn't run and get flashcards. So the reality is that adding words to that data bank of familiar words is something that happens automatically and unconsciously and behind the scenes. And we need an expression, excuse me, we need an explanation from that, from the scientific community. And I, and I think we have it, and I'm only gonna be able to touch upon it briefly, but it gets at the core of why some children seem to pick up on reading more easily than others. So here are the key skills that we need. You need a, a, a skill called orthographic mapping. Um, that is a mental process that allows us to remember words. It's, it, it's orthographic learning is learning of strings of letters, familiar strings. Uh, but orthographic mapping is an explanation of how that learning occurs. Um, and it applies to parts of words, not just words. And it's, it's how we build that orthographic lexicon. Um, now, other than the visual input, we have to input that letter string visually, but once that input has occurred, the language system kicks in, okay? It's not a visual memory process. Uh, two of the leading theories on orthographic learning are that of David Scher and Linnea Airy. And if we kind of merge them a little bit, they overlap quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> the idea is we, you know, our teachers didn't teach us all the words we know. We, we learned them as, you know, we knew the code, we sounded out words, and we added them to that data bank of familiar words. But if we don't, if we're not able to sound out the word, the, the possibility of remembering that for the future do, uh, drops dramatically. So the, the phonic, uh, phonetic decoding that's needed to figure out a new word is also key to creating uh, a memory for that particular sequence of letters. If we look at it holistically, we're not doing that. Our attention's drawn away from the orthographic sequence. And so the idea is that we anchor spoken pronunciations to the strings of letters at the phoneme level, the phoneme grapheme level, uh, not, not a holistic type of phenomena. But once we know a word and the, and the sequence is familiar, it feels holistic. So, so uh, if, we're, if we think that word reading is, is based on some whole word type thing, we're going on our feelings, not based on science. Um, you know, we look at FBI and we don't go FBI or NFL. We see it as a unit because it's familiar and it jumps out at us. But if you see NLF, you go, what's that, right? Um, and you have to notice that this is different than phonetic decoding. So with phonetic decoding, you don't know what the word is. You're looking at the word and you're using your letter sound knowledge and you're blending. But with orthographic mapping, you can't store the word until you know what it is. So you're looking at the word and now you're connecting, you're going in the opposite direction. You're connecting the pronunciation to the print. Phonetic decoding, you're going from the print to the pronunciation. So it works a little bit like this. If this is the spoken word read in your phonological long-term memory, that's what PLTN is. If you have phoneme uh, skills, that you can pull apart the phonemes in the spoken word read, now in your memory system, you have a ready uh, uh, set of, of shelves, so to speak, to, to, to store that particular pronunciation, or excuse me, that particular letter string connected to that pronunciation. And after just a couple of exposures, now you have it. Uh, and then you have a word, you know, like make, you know, here it's a little bit different because, gee, we have an extra letter here. But we, uh, make an adjustment to the map. And we do the same with irregular words. So from a standpoint of remembering letter sequences, we have the same problem between this regular word and this irregular word, uh, because in both cases, there's a silent letter at the end. And now I, I got to believe that knowing the silent E rule helps with this. But interestingly, we don't have research that specific. So that's just a, that's just an educated guess. So the skills we need to pull this all off, to, to sound out words, that first type of word reading, you need to have letter sound knowledge and you need to be able to blend at the phoneme level. There's C-A-T and you go cat, cat. But orthographic mapping requires a greater uh, degree of proficiency in both of those areas, uh, the phonology and the letter sound skills. So letter sound proficiency, you give a CVC nonsense word to an ending first grader who's on target learning to read, they say it instantly. So that means they have letter sound proficiency. You do some sophisticated phonemic task to a skilled reader from late second or third grade on, they respond instantly. They're not mulling it over in their head. 
Uh, so you need a higher level of proficiency, and that proficiency grows from first grade through until about third or fourth grade, depending on the study and how they went about it. But the issue is that the, the phonic approach, which we, which is foundational to any read for any reader, uh, the phonic skills um, that get taught really take you to an ending first grade level because the, you're able to sound out based on your letter sound knowledge. But what happens is your letter sound proficiency grows after first grade and your phonemic proficiency grows after first grade. And that really allows you by third grade to have that sight word explosion because now that connection forming process is happening automatically in the background, like I talked about earlier, where by the end of first grade, it's not that automatic yet, okay? So why is it difficult for some kids? Well, to cut to the chase, there's something researchers have been talking about called the phonological core deficit of dyslexia. And um, it, it's comprised of, of these five different elements. It could be six, depending on how you divide them up. Um, and kids that have dyslexia do not get a clean bill of health on all these. But yet, typically developing readers do. They get a clean bill of health on every one of these, right? Um, and also, researchers have not found any alternatives to this explanation. And when you think about the nature of alphabetic writing, it makes perfect sense. Alphabetic writing is keying into the, the phonemic structure of the spoken language. That's how we're representing print. And if you have problems with phonemes, you're going to have problems with reading an alphabetic writing system. It's not a visual memory type thing. And we have not found any causal alternative uh, to the phonological core deficit. Um, now, one of the problems with our popular approaches to reading, and some of this has been touched upon, so I don't need to say too much, but the classic whole word approach, it presumes that words are remember, uh, remembered based on some sort of visual memory process, which it's not. Um, and it doesn't direct kids' attention to that orthographic structure, that letter order, and how that letter order connects up with the pronunciation uh, to help them remember it. And with balanced literacy, that, that whole enterprise kind of melds together and com, uh, conflates word reading and comprehension. And whenever you use guessing strategies, whether it's pictures, context, first sounds, how, how the word looks or the length or, or whether you got, you know, uh, extenders or, you know, descenders, all of that, if you're able to figure out the word, it absolves you from attending to the internal structure of the, of the printed word and how that maps onto the internal structure of the spoken word. So in a sense, it directs your attention. Both of these approaches direct your attention away from the very thing kids need the most to remember words. Now, most children survive this, uh, you know, different estimates because our, our proficiency level is not that high as we've learned today. Um, but a, a fair number of kids survive this, and they develop these skills in spite of the fact that they weren't taught. Uh, and they do direct their attention in the right uh, way. But if you have some difficulties with the phonology of spoken language, it's not going to come to you. It, it, you're going to need very explicit systematic teaching like people have been talking about all day. Uh, so those with the phonological core deficit, they're going to default to these approaches because they don't have the good phonology that allows them to move forward uh, the way they need to move forward in the absence of direct instruction of this. So with that said, I mentioned with phonics instruction, you have some kids with mild uh, phonological core deficit. These kids are very responsive to phonics instruction, but they flounder in our traditional classrooms. But you give them the phonics instruction and they can go on and live happily ever after. Those, they have the mild phonological core deficit. Moderate the phonological core deficit, these children will make progress in a phonic program, but they're not going to be good at remembering words. And we have a lot of studies to show that, that, that a disparity between the improvement, nationally normed improvement in nonsense word reading versus real word reading. And then you have the severe cases, and people talked about that 5%, but we can move that 5%. We're not going to take kids that are now in the first percentile and get them up to the 75th percentile, but we can get them to maybe the 25th or 30th. We have research to show we can do that. So we're not saying that every single child, even in the most extreme cases, are going to be wonderful readers, but they can be far more functional. And sending kids out into the world with a fifth or sixth grade word reading level is giving them a gift compared to what we're doing now with some of our severe dyslexic kids sending them off into the world at a first and second uh, grade reading level. So we can, we can move that curve. So with the severe type kids, those are the kids who don't seem to benefit from phonics, but it's because they don't have even basic phonological skills. They, those phonological skills need to be built and then they can benefit from phonics. Oops, sorry about that. So when it comes to prevention intervention, I'm just going to summarize what the, what the reading panel said, and, and we've had similar results since then. But if you do, in tier one kindergarten and first grade, you do 
explicit and systematic teaching of letter sound skills and phonological awareness and show how they connect, then uh, what we have seen with at-risk kids end up with 13 standard score points, the equivalent of 13 standard score points higher than, than at-risk kids, comparable at-risk kids that don't get this kind of instruction. And then you come back a year or two later and that expands out to 20 points. So what does that mean? That means that those children uh, that got that kind of instruction, a large portion of them are going on to live happily ever after in reading and other kids continue to flounder that don't get that kind of instruction. So the best bang for your buck is to do tier one systematic instruction of phonological awareness and letter sound knowledge. And, and don't teach them to use default strategies like guessing because that's going to help them that's gonna circumvent what we're trying to do. When it comes to uh, intervention research, when we look at national standard score gains, uh, that's gonna tell us if the child is actually closing the gap. We see three different groups. One group, if you don't, if you don't do phonics, or if you do phonics with no phonemic, uh, additional phonemic awareness, you get about one to five standard score points, mostly in about the three or four range. But if you do phonemic awareness along with the phonics, you see a, a nicer improvements, right? However, when you do more intensive phonemic awareness, getting to what I referred to earlier is that level of proficiency, you see the largest gains. And these gains are sustained over time. And that's pretty exciting, okay? So as a summary, and I think I'm a couple of minutes over, word level reading is primarily phonological in nature at the level of the phoneme because that's how our writing system is designed. Skilled readers are good at sounding out unfamiliar words that they come across. And they're also good at remembering words. So either of those skills are optional and, and one builds on the other. But we have to look at letter sound proficiency and phonemic proficiency if we want kids to be good readers, not just letter sound knowledge and not just letter sound, excuse me, phonemic awareness. We need to ramp it up. We need to get them up to a third or fourth grade level in these skills. After third or fourth grade, folks, for, for kids on target learning to read, the difference between adults and children um, uh, are, are just more vocabulary, experience, size of the site vocabulary. The mechanics are in place for typically developing readers by about third or fourth grade. But we need to get kids up to that level and we're not getting them there uh, with a fair, fair, fairly large portion of kids. Um, most reading problems are preventable, not all, but most are preventable. And those that aren't preventable, we can still move the dial on those kids. There's really no good reason a kid should graduate high school with anything lower than about a fifth grade word reading level. And that's pretty functional in today's world, okay? And it's way more functional than a second grade word, le re word reading level. Uh, we're not gonna get them all up to high school level, you know, that bottom 2% or 3%. Um, and, you know, the most highly inter uh, effective interventions did that more intensive phonemic awareness, got them to the level of proficiency, letter sound skills, not optional, and of course, it gave them appropriate reading practice in their texts. So with the right tools and the right knowledge, we can make, you've been hearing this all morning, we can really change lives. We can make a real big difference for kids.